Let me begin by acknowledging in the spirit of reconciliation that Melbourne Business School is on the lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of the land for thousands of years. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Glenn Hetker. I'm a professor of strategy and innovation at MBS. And I also have the privilege to direct our Center for Sustainability and business. The center is committed to supporting an environmentally and economically thriving Australia. And to do so, we draw on the strengths of MBS at levels from the macro economy to the individual to facilitate conversations such as today's, provide new insights through leading edge multidisciplinary research and develop leaders with critical skills. Turning to today's topic, net zero is increasingly high on agendas in business, government and elsewhere. It topped the agenda at last week's G7 meeting in the UK, was the subject of a game-changing recent report by the International Energy Agency, and Closer to Home is increasingly a focus of business and government. Net zero seems simple enough on the surface. It means that the amount of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are balanced by removal out of the atmosphere. Only by achieving this balance can we stay below our carbon budget that is the total amount of greenhouse gases we can emit if we're to reach the Paris Agreement goal of keeping global warming well below two degrees centigrade and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. Questions and debates remain, however, in the best way to achieve net zero and how responsibility for doing so should be allocated. Particularly fraught for some sectors are scope three emissions, that is the indirect emissions that occur throughout the supply chain of the reporting company, upstream and downstream, and in the case of financial institutions, emissions facilitated by financing and investment activities. To help us unpack net zero, we're joined today by Jody Barnes, Senior Analyst, ESG at the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, Don Henry, Enterprise Professor of Environmentalism at MBS and University of Melbourne, and Tony Wood, Director of the Grattan Institute's Energy and Climate Change Program. We reserve time for the panelists to address your questions. So as the sessions proceeds, please take advantage of the Q&A box to either add your own questions or upvote existing questions by using the thumbs up button. Let's start by thinking about what net zero means for different sectors. Jody, the ASX is Australia's leading share market index. The ASX 200 has the top 200 listed companies therein. Axie have done a lot of work in analyzing ASX 200 climate related responses in recent years. What are you seeing across different sectors? Thanks, Glenn. Um, and, you know, Axie represent long term institutional shareholders. So for our members, climate change is one of the most financial um, risks and, and biggest market issues that they're trying to manage within their portfolios. So we've been doing a lot of research on the pace of change and what companies are telling us um, about their climate-related disclosure because without this kind of information, it's really difficult for investors to integrate climate risks into their portfolios. So when I answer the question, like, you know, what is changing within the ASX 200 and across sectors, I really address it in two camps. And the first is on the risk management and preparation side. And then the second is, you know, the actions undertaken uh, to align the businesses to, to the Paris Agreement. Um, so on the first section on the risk management and preparation side, uh, ASX listed companies actually compare quite favourably to other jurisdictions, particularly other jurisdictions that have much stronger climate policy. And what we're finding in our research is that, um, you know, 80, 80 companies now use the TCFD framework. Um, and within that, we tend to find really high levels of adoption in the higher risk sectors. So the materials, the um, industrials, miners, energy and utilities. Um, additionally, we're also seeing most banks using the TCFD framework to address their climate related risk. Um, and then on scenario analysis, which is a really important tool, particularly for high risk uh, sectors in understanding where their risks lie. Um, we've seen almost a doubling of the number of companies undertaking scenario analysis from 2019 to 2020 reporting. But we are seeing most uh, industries with really high risks not using a 1.5 degree scenario, which is the ultimate aim of the Paris Agreement. And then on um, net zero announcements, which is the focus of this um, session, 
uh, there's now 46 companies in the ASX 200 with net zero commitments. It was 18 last year, so it was a pretty big jump. Uh, but we do tend to see these in sectors where it is uh, more straightforward or there is a defined pathway to reach uh, net zero, where we tend to find those where, with more challenging pathways, um, possibly in the uh, cement and concrete uh, steel sectors, that, that it's quite challenging. But then if I flip over to, you know, the Paris action um, and what companies are really doing to align their business, um, it, it's a little bit more of a different story. So what we are finding is that, you know, on that challenging sectors and mapping the pathway, companies find it really challenging after making a net zero commitment if they're in the higher risk sectors or in sectors where their business has to fundamentally change in mapping what their short and medium term commitments are to get to that net zero ambition. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a really concerning area for, for our members because, you know, if you're a carbon intensive or fossil fuels based company, your climate change strategy has to be your corporate strategy. Um, and for our members, you know, long term multi generational investments, the timelines over those investments are highly correlated with the timelines in which physical and transitional impacts will emerge throughout the economy. So, um, you know, realistically for these companies to create and retain value in a low carbon transition, we need to see more of it integrated and, and more actions and, and disclosure of these actions on how they're aligning to their business. But what we have found, and, and one of the reasons that we might be seeing this kind of lack of setting of medium and short term targets and investment in R&D and innovation is because when we looked at what the scenario analysis was telling us in the ASX 200, it paints a really rosy picture. So of the 60 companies that have undertaken scenario analysis in the ASX 200, and I'm talking about disclosure from coal, oil and gas, energy generation, construction materials, um, every single one of them has told me that they're resilient. Um, they do quantify some downside impacts, but these are also companies and industries that haven't disclosed pathways to get to Paris. But a running scenario analysis and telling us that they're telling us that they're resilient mostly under you know well below two degree scenarios so that's roughly what Axie is seeing in in the space at the moment fantastic and as part of that you mentioned the tcfd can you um just briefly um define and expand on that for us yeah of course um i fall into acronyms very easy so <clears throat> tcfd is the task force on climate related financial disclosures it's a principle-based framework to address climate-related disclosure. Investors have found it a incredibly useful tool because what we found is that that framework moved climate-related disclosure from carbon accounting, which is looking back and saying, what's the footprint of the portfolio? What's the footprint of this company? To um, addressing it in a more forward-looking manner. So it, it gets companies to start thinking about what's their governance and oversight of climate risk what are their risks and opportunities across the transition and across different time horizons? And it really pushes companies to then run scenario analysis, talk about how their business is or is not resilient, and then set targets and metrics for, for aligning the business. Fantastic, thank you. Don Henry, you speak with many senior leaders in business, government, and elsewhere about climate change, their perspectives, and their responses. When it comes to net zero and emission reduction targets across different sectors, what's your sense of things? Uh, Glenn, thanks for the question, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Glenn, I think uh, I'd share a couple of thoughts, if I may. One is how quickly momentum is building around net zero and also being on pathways to achieve net zero. So for example, the G7 uh, last week in their communique, we saw all the G7 countries committing to net zero by 2050, urging others to follow. We saw them all committing to halving their emissions on something like a 2010 baseline, but halving their emissions by 2030 and making comments about the need for finance to drive in these changes. Um, in some ways in the business community, that's echoed here in Australia. Um, as Jody was saying, there are many uh, businesses across a whole range of sectors, including resources sector, uh, now committed to net zero by 2050, the Business Council of Australia is. So there's a, a lot of momentum and movement. 
in the business community here. Jody's right. It's an easier commitment for some sectors than others, and we might unpack that uh, as we go, uh, Glenn. Just to um, also comment on civil society around the world. So there's discussion about absolute zero in civil society. So being zero without sequestration, for example. Uh, and there's also discussion about the importance of hitting the 1.5 degree Paris goal. Uh, people may recall the Paris goal is well below two, striving to 1.5. And the most recent science out of the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Jody, I'll try and unpack acronyms as well. Um, the most recent science there is there's a big difference in the impacts people and the planet will face between, for example, two degrees and 1.5. So that's quite a big discussion across civil society and many governments in the world as well, Glenn. Thank you very much, Don. Tony Wood, uh, reducing the emission of our energy system is clearly uh, particularly critical. And for many years, uh, the Grattan Institute has led analysis, reporting and commentary on that topic, including just a recently released report on Go for Net Zero, a practical plan for reliable, affordable, low emissions electricity. Now, you've said that Australia should commit only to net zero emissions in the national electricity market by the 2040s, not absolute zero or 100% renewable energy. Why is that? Well, thanks, Glenn, and um, very pleased that Grattan's able to uh, join with Melbourne Business School in, um, uh, in this event this morning. Um, look, what we sometimes try and do in our work, Glenn, is to look at facts, look at opinions, and then look at myths. And um, sometimes the analysis one does helps you unpack uh, which is which. Now, in this case, what we're interested in exploring was the boundaries between we can't possibly power cities like Sydney and Melbourne with, wind, with a few wind farms and solar panels. And the other extreme is, of course we can, we can get there easily and it'll all be fine. We just got to get the coal fired power stations out, out of the, uh, off the planet. And what we discovered is that um, neither is actually true. And that's, obvious, that's often uh, what you conclude in many parts of our lives that the extremes are very seldom the right answer. So what we did is a lot of detailed analysis based upon what uh, a future electricity system would look like in Australia. And we tested that with different combinations of generation and different combinations of weather patterns and real weather patterns over about at least 10 years. And we discovered three things. One is we can go a long way to reducing emissions in the electricity sector at relatively low cost. We can get to 60, 70, 80, 90% um, uh, emissions reductions. And as, at the end, of, as we get towards that 90%, we've gone from a sector that produces best part of used to produce more, more than about 200 million tonnes a year to the sector producing about 10 million tonnes a year. Mm. As we do that, the amount of transmission we have to build increases dramatically because we're trying to move electricity um, in line with moving climate and weather across the uh, east coast of Australia. Um, and that means the value of that transmission and the cost involved with that transmission go up. That's the second thing. Third thing is that as we get towards 80, 90%, and I wouldn't want to be precise about this because we don't know yet what, how this world's going to unfold. What you find is that it becomes increasingly difficult to meet periods of low solar output, low wind output, and high electricity demand. And at some point, based upon the best information we have now about the technologies, a better option rather than chase the last few million tonnes out of the electricity sector, there's a lot of other things we should be doing in other sectors, which will be a lower cost and more effective in reducing emissions. Now we may solve this problem when we get to 95, 98%. It may be 10 to 15 years time, all sorts of things will emerge. But at the moment we think that it's in some ways misleading to suggest we can get to zero um, at an affordable cost. Doesn't mean we can't get a long way, but we think an appropriate uh, target is net zero. And that might mean, for example, a relatively modest, uh, role for gas to offset um, the emissions from wind and solar and possibly um, the real use of um, what we would call real offsets. And that's something you introduced earlier. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much. Uh, several of you flagged the, the changing rate of, of activity 
and ambition in this area. And so, so let me come um, to you again, Jody Barnes. The with AXA, you directly engage with many boards and executives teams to understand and inform their climate-related agendas and responses. Uh, what changes are you seeing in urgency and what do you think is driving them? Yeah, um, and it's a good question. So for those on the on the webinar who, who are not familiar with AXA, <coughs> our role is to directly engage with um, ASX-listed boards on a range of ESG issues. And the role I have at AXA is engaging with our, our most carbon-intensive and fossil fuels-based companies on on climate change. And from my experience as someone who sits behind the closed doors with these chairs and directors, um, what I would say is that the landscape and the depths of the conversations we're having with these companies on climate change has significantly changed over the last five or six years. Mm. And companies really do see it as a part of their obligation and their social license to operate both in Australia and globally. Um, But what we're seeing is that directors uh, are acutely aware of the value creation and loss that that is tied to climate change adaptation or or lack of ambition. Um, And, you know, we are seeing companies have a rush to build expertise within their business as well. So some of those that come to mind are a Blue Scope who have recently appointed a chief executive of climate. BHP has built out a big climate change team, as has Santos and Ampol in that process. And the really big drivers, um, as I said, you know, that, that value cr- loss and creation, you know, if I, if I think of some of the investor presentations that have been um, in the last few years, uh, you know, four out of the six earnings downgrades at Boral cited adverse weather impacts. Rio Tinto in 2018 um, looked at, at an EBITDA loss that was due to iron ore shipments from the Pilbara being impacted by weather events. Australian agricultural company um, just this year said that investors should expect earning headwinds based from prolonged drought and then Gulf flood events. And then on transition risk, you just have to look at our our two largest um, energy generators. The influx of cheap renewables um, has driven down daytime wholesale electricity prices to levels where many coal-fired power assets are expected to be cash negative. And if you just look back to the last quarter, Origin Energy um, managed a rearing in a really interesting way where they where they chose not to run a rearing at, at capacity and bought cheap electricity from the wholesale market at lower mm. prices. So that value loss and creation is a significant one. But the other one that I think is worth touching on is the cost of capital. So, you know, on the investor side, through engagement in groups like Axie, Investors are setting really clear expectations for companies that they have to decarbonise and map out their business transition. And part of that's demonstrated in the proliferation Mm. of net zero commitments that investors are making themselves. But equally, it's on how willing investors are to provide additional capital for projects. So, you know, if you're going ahead with a big LNG growth project, there's a lot of anxiety amongst investors for companies with those type of trajectories. And it's you know, even more clear when you look at thermal coal, that, you know, the view on thermal coal is that long-term it's a stranded asset. So what you find is investors move money away from those areas um, when the financial risk becomes too great. But then on the credit credit aside, you know, the cost of capital, there's a growing cohort of, of lending restrictions to higher risk industries. But then also we are seeing a number of companies who are setting really strong um, sustainability targets start to um, access cheaper long-term finance through sustainable finance initiatives, sustainability-linked loans. So um, I think that's the other part of, of that cost of capital side. We're really starting to see banks um, think about their lending portfolios and, and where the risks lie within those. Fantastic. Thank you. And actually, we have a question from the audience um, that uh, to you. Uh, you had mentioned that a lot of companies, including mining, had found that they were resilient in their scenario analysis they'd been carrying out. Um, is your sense, is that based on, on assumptions about political climate or is that based on larger economic and, and technological trends? What, what gives them that confidence? Yeah, so it's probably a bit of both. So um, a lot of companies, you know, when they undertake scenario analysis, they tweak the scenarios to outcomes um, or trajectories that they think are more plausible. And, and in Australia, we do um, we are seen as an outlier when it comes to the, the net zero trajectory. 
Um, but the other aspect is um, we are seeing a high reliance on um, emerging technologies. And, and for some industries, it's highly relevant to include. So, for example, in um, industries where you're never going to get to absolute zero or, um, you know, CCS um, is, a, is a very real assumption. But we are seeing carbon offsets being used um, probably in industries that you wouldn't see relying long term on on nature based offsets as an example mm. um, like in energy generation um, but yeah it, it's a bit of a combination of you know what they think is a more likely trajectory to play out and also the the reliance on um, CCS or CCUS and offsets and emerging technologies and hydrogen as an, as an example. Thank you. I'm going to ask, ask you to unpack those acronyms. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so carbon capture and storage and carbon capture utilization and, and storage. So um, different ways. So carbon capture and storage is where you're capturing that carbon and storing it. Um, so for example, Santos is looking at that option where they're going to store emitted carbon back into the depleted um, uh, the depleted basins. And then utilization is where you're obviously making use of it in different ways. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, Tony, can I ask you to build on this and, and can we hear your thoughts on the current pace of change in relation to net zero? Uh, <clears throat> the term that comes to mind for me is, it feels like a year of magical thinking. Um, <laughs> And what I mean by that is that um, the adoption of the language of net zero has been extraordinarily fast. It's driven by, I think, a lot of pressure on companies, um, particularly their shareholders, um, civil society, uh, the, the, all sorts of pressures, right? Um, in, the prudential authorities and so on. And, you know, the sort of things that Jody's talking about, um, it's no longer acceptable for companies simply to make these statements. The authorities are now saying, well, wait a second, you've told the market, you've told your shareholders that you're going to achieve net zero by this date. What, are they, what do you mean by net zero and how are you going to do that? And so what I find is that the realisation of what it means to be committed to net zero in whatever definition an organisation uses is actually much slower and a long way behind the promises that are being made. Um, and the reason for this is because people are bad, evil, or anything else. The reason is it's bloody hard to seriously think about what net zero means. And even when you say it accurately and simply as you did, uh, Glenn, that, well, at some point, for every ton we put into the atmosphere, we have to take a ton out of the atmosphere. It's no, you can't just build some more solar panels to get to net zero. This is serious stuff. And of course, the offsets that uh, Jody was talking about and there's only a limited uh, number of areas where you can do that. They are, some of them are quite questionable for many people in relation to how much integrity they've got. And they will become quite expensive quite quickly as everyone starts to decide, well, we're gonna do this much ourselves and we'll offset the rest. I'm always tempted to put all of my superannuation money into buying offsets right now because I think this could be a very active market in the future, Glenn. But we'll see. So I think there's a the big challenge here for businesses is to seriously think through, and this is actually quite hard to do, uh, what are the real strategic implications for their business as the climate changes, as the world moves to address climate change, and as Australia moves to address climate change. And some of that is, as I said, hard to do internally. And then to clearly put that to your stakeholders, because if you don't get this clear, and we've seen this happen already, those stakeholders, whoever they are, will come after you. And if you haven't been clear, they'll keep coming and they'll keep coming and you won't be able to run fast enough. That's a great way of looking at it. Thank you. Um, Don Henry, can you help us take a step back? Um, what are your thoughts on the recent G7 summit and other international climate related developments this year? Uh, Glenn, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, we had the communique out of the G7, uh, I think it was last Monday, our time uh, in Australia, and I thought I might just unpack a couple of bits of it, uh, because uh, as everyone's been saying, it shows the extent of movement uh, on these issues by the biggest economies uh, in the world. Just a couple of things, uh, a little bit disconnected, forgive me, but... Um, 
for example, when the G7 in their communique talks about climate and the environment, they say the unprecedented and independent crises of climate change and biodiversity loss pose an existential threat to people, prosperity, security, and nature. I'll come back to that, but a little point worth noting there is they're elevating biodiversity along with uh, climate change. Um, they also, uh, I've mentioned their commitments uh, to net zero by 2050 and to halving their emissions by 2030 on a pathway to that on a 2010 baseline. They talk about the International um, Energy Agency's recent report on net zero, the IEA, a highly respected agency on energy worldwide, had a look at what net zero means to the energy sector and every other sector that's using energy. They highlight the importance of that report. Um, they've uh, committed to end new direct government support for unabated international thermal coal generation by the end of 2021. And some of that's driving out of that IEA report. Uh, they've also uh, said this in, a, in uh, a conclusion that uh, achieving a global green and resilient recovery offers the greatest economic opportunity of our time to boost income, innovation, jobs, productivity and growth while also tackling the issues of climate change and environmental degradation. So I'd like to perhaps finish on that point because there's, there's swings and roundabouts in this very rapid transition. There are elements of risk for business, but there are also elements of very substantial opportunity. And it's worth just reflecting on this. The G7 uh, countries uh, are all in northern latitudes many of which, like Germany, get half the solar radiation of Australia. And in some ways, this transition that in large part is being based on uh, renewable energy positions Australia very well. We've got elements of our economy for which it'll be a challenge, but we're, we're the best positioned developed country to benefit from renewable uh, energy opportunities uh, to drive what's an electrification uh, of our economies. Thanks, Glenn. Fantastic, thank you. Um, several questions uh, from the audience have, have touched on that contrast um, between global developments, uh, the G7, the IEA, et cetera, and recent um, domestic political developments. From the viewpoint of business decision makers, could any of you um, say a bit about the, the, how you see companies navigating the, the contrast between um, what's happening, at least on the surface, in domestic politics around net zero and what seems to be happening globally around net zero? I'll have a short go, Glenn. Um, it seems to me the answer to your question is how well are they dealing with it? The answer is somewhere between not very well and a degree of despair almost. Um, because businesses, uh, and I've got to be careful of the language, they're not looking for certainty. What they need is predictability. Mm -hmm. They'll make their own decisions about how they make risk. But what, what, they're, what they're finding is that the, the environment into which they have to manage making investments with the risks that that entails and making profit out of taking risks sensibly is much harder when there's a very unpredictable policy environment. And I think the what used to be a very strong connection, I think, between coalition governments in Australia and business has, to some extent, broken. Hmm. Um, and you see governments almost blaming businesses and beating up businesses for not doing what they want. And that, you know, electricity sector is somewhat famous in Australia for that. And so the businesses on the other hand are trying to work, what the, how do we deal with this? Um, you know, consumers still want to use 
uh, electricity. They still want to live their lives the way they do. The question is, how do we make sure that that electricity is becoming increasingly um, uh, positive in relation to the environment, not negative? And that's really hard to do. So I think we're in a difficult situation right now where a combination of very strong domestic politics and yesterday's events have only made that, I suspect, a bit more challenging for the government and for business, though, to think about where they go. And all that happens is one of two things. Either businesses just withdraw. I mean, I, I've spoken to a number of investor groups who are saying, we don't know how to invest in this sector. We're just going to stop. Now, that has two, and that, has the, that builds on the second consequence, which is the cost go up. Because when there's more risk, there's more costs for businesses, and those costs are passed through to consumers. And so that may, that's more likely to make this transition more difficult than easier, I think. Fantastic. Thank you. Don, Jody? Jody, are you wanting to jump in or should oh, I kick I'll, off? I will very quickly say that, um, you know, from the engagement that we're doing with companies, what we know is that anything that's within their kind of operational capacity where they can make iterative um, emissions uh, improvements and, and efficiency improvements, business is already on the road doing that and they're getting to the point where they actually have to start making significant capital allocation within their businesses and have different parts of their business is going to draw really really heavily down on, on that investment. So exactly what I would echo what Tony said, you know, investors and the companies need some type of policy predictability because without having a reasonably stable federal policy on climate, it becomes really challenging um, both to incentivize change domestically, but also to attract investment um, into those into those areas. And, and a lot of the new investments and technologies that need to be developed um, require um, that policy certainty. So if I just think of Santos, they recently um, tested the market for what, what their customers would pay for a um, low or no carbon product. And the answer from every Australian customer was the premium they'd pay is zero. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'd completely echo what Tony said. It, there needs to be predictability. Glenn, if I may follow Jody, just a couple of thoughts here. <clears throat> In the Australian Federation, what we tend to see is when the federal policy making is uneven, the states often move forward. And so, for instance, at the moment, every Australian state is committed to net zero by 2050. Victoria's aligned with the halving of emissions that the G7 has announced. Uh, but, you know, that's not necessarily ideal for business, which would like predictability at the federal level. I'd also make the point at the federal level, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, you know, for example, we've got good innovation with the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, arguably the largest green bank in the world. Uh, the renewable energy target has uh, stimulated a lot of renewable investment in Australia. Its power is now weakened. But we have got big gaps federally. The, the final point on, I'd make on that, there's a successful history in Australia of businesses uh, helping with the enabling environment, the policy environment, and if you like, creating the space for governments to move, because this is not just a, a one colour of government issue. These are tough issues. And so, for instance, the very Clean Energy Finance Corporation that I mentioned came out of a collaboration of the finance sector and some of civil society trying to imagine and think through uh, how you boost mainstream investment into cleaner economies in Australia. So there's a very uh, constructive role that business can play, not only in their own business, but helping, if you like, create the political space for movement. And I think that's important in our democracy. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so we've been talking about net zero, but something that some companies have talked about um, that, that has been on the horizon in some sectors is this idea of absolute zero maybe is the next horizon. And um, Tony, the Grattan Institute recently hosted a forum titled Zero or Net Zero, Does It Matter? And Should We Care? Um, what insights might you share, including for those who haven't encountered the term before, what do we really mean by absolute 
as opposed to net zero? Um, well, I think the literal definition would be that we better stop, we better all start holding our breath. Um, and that's not, that's a slightly facetious comment, but when you think about some of the things that go on, the, the idea that <coughs> the world's going to be absolute zero is actually in some ways nonsensical because the issue is we've got to, it's this point about how much goes in has to how much come out. And the world <coughs> used to do that itself, right? <laughs> we as in our industrial society and in our modern economy have screwed it up. I mean, the world was in balance. It wasn't uh, absolute zero emissions. The, the role of CO2, you know, many of the climate change denying groups have used the very positive role that CO2 has in a total um, environment as a way of justifying that CO2 is good in a sense. And I think the argument when you position this about good and evil is certainly not helpful. Um, but when, there's a couple of things about net zero that I still find intriguing. Um, one is, uh, and this was people who may have read Bill Gates' most recent book on this issue, and he makes the point that um, this is like a bathtub filling up. Um, we're constantly putting more water in the bathtub. And at some point we're gonna either have to stop or open the plug hole. And the point is when we, because at some point, if we don't, the bath just overflows. And that's where we're getting to with, with emissions. So we have to get to the point where either we stop putting um, more, more water in the bath or the amount going out the bottom equals the amount going in the top. And that's, gonna, that's a, quite a challenging question, particularly when organizations talk about, well, what we mean by net zero is net zero operational emissions. Now, in some ways, that's taking a very technical view that well, this is what we're responsible for and what other people outside in our supply chain are responsible for is now our responsibility. We'll have to deal with the consequences if our customers don't want to buy carbon intensive products. We'll have to deal with the consequences of our suppliers are putting up the cost of the zero emission supplies that we want to buy, but they're not the things that are absolutely in our control. Now, the problem with that eventually for some companies is that it's a bit like saying, well, we're growing our tobacco using organic fertilizers, therefore it's good. We've got no responsibility for what people do with that tobacco, right? Now, that's, as people would reckon, I'm not using that against tobacco companies particularly, but you know, that will change dramatically for the whole tobacco industry. And the same yeah. thing happened with the asbestos industry and the same thing's happening with the carbon industries. So it's very hard, it seems to me, for companies, particularly like resource companies and, and even more so companies whose resource base is in carbon intensive activity to make these claims without backing them up. But how does a company like Shell or BH or BP achieve net zero? They, what they do, what they're really good at is digging up, finding gas and oil, getting it out of the ground, putting it on ships and getting to customers. They're not very good. And they've tried it in come to building solar farms and wind farms and dealing with those sort of things. So how do they reinvent themselves? And I think that's where the whole question of um, what does net zero really mean? And how much are the stakeholders, the prudential authorities, the environmental activists, um, the concerned investors and all those sort of people, how, what are they looking for from these companies? Because I think you've really got to think hard about what net, zero, what net zero means. And as we go up, as the economy does what I was talking about for the electricity sector, as the economy gradually addresses all the cheap and easy things to do, and we'll, we'll redefine what cheap and easy is in the future as well, I think, we start to get to the harder and more expensive. And that's where this question of what is net zero and what are offsets actually mean. And I think when we get, as we approach that point, um, the importance of clear strategic thinking will be essential because I completely support what Don was saying. And that is, that's when we'll see the opportunities for those organizations who've been able to see what's coming earlier and start to build their businesses on those emerging opportunities that'll come as we get into those difficult areas. Thank you. And, and as a professor of strategy, it's, it's heartening to, to hear you draw those connections between the response to strategy and, and ultimately competitive advantage for firms and sectors. Um, thank you. Don, there are a number of companies that have made a, a commitment to absolute zero. Um, not in some of the, the hardest to abate sectors, as one might expect. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Uh, Glenn, you're absolutely right. So, for example, if you look at Lend-Lease, uh, areas of their operation already at absolute zero. Um, <clears throat> to be a little thoughtful on this, 
so if you just look at the overall carbon budget globally, and we're recognising in this conversation that it's going to be easier for some sectors than others to achieve net zero, same thing with absolute zero. And so the energy sector is transforming quite quickly now, and one will see transport follow quickly over the next decade. Jody's right, Jody, in your earlier point, there's some industrial sectors like uh, steel making uh, and concrete where the very chemical uh, processes that we use at the moment entail substantial emissions, whether that's you know, coking coal or whatever, and there's serious investment going into needed new technology development and you know, hydrogen is one of the, the key opportunities. Australia very well positioned there globally uh, and domestically. Um, so the abs absolute zero, I think, will be needed in a number of sectors if we're overall going to hit net zero. Uh, if you like, there needs to be some breathing space for some of the harder to abate sectors that require technology transformation. And they're going to be interesting and, and tough debates out there. Glenn, if I could do a linked point here and back to play to your strategy role, there's, there's a couple of nice, interesting things to think about with net zero. It does provide an opportunity to drive strategic thinking in a company. It challenges you to map out the future and to map it out uh, carefully. But there's one thing to be aware of in that, uh, net zero by 2050 doesn't start at 2050. It means we have to be net zero at 2050. And think about that for a minute. So this is where, for instance, lend leases commitment and appetite is interesting. Uh, the infrastructure we're building today, the cities and towns, we're building today, much of that infrastructure is going to be here in 2050. So it actually has to be built net zero today. And I suspect that's why Lend-Lease will be feeling a responsibility, but also seeing an opportunity to be an early mover in a space that has to move early. Hmm. Thanks, Dan. It's a helpful distinction between uh, different sectors and, and as a whole. Thank you. Um, Jody, informed by your corporate engagement analysis activities, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, you know, the focus I have mostly with my companies because they are in the carbon intensive fossil fuels based is, is net zero. That's the ultimate game. Um, Don pointed out Lend Lease has an absolute zero target. When I looked through all the companies yesterday, the only other company that was in that space was Mervac, and I think they're, they're net positive, so they're planning to generate more energy than they consume. Um, but really, the focus um, in the companies I work with are around net zero, and um, Tony is right in that most of it is set around scope one and scope two, so the operational emissions that they have control of. What we are looking for in those sectors, you know, if I touch briefly on scope three, which is, you know, the emissions from the products that they sell, um, we are expecting companies to do work in this area, particularly if, you know, the demand curve drops off, an, off a ledge um, for, the, for the products you're going to sell. You're going to have to, going to, have to move anyway. Um, so, you know, what we do expect companies in this space to do is start creating partnerships, start looking at innovation, investing, mm -hmm. um, look at research and development. And we are starting to see that. So some of the discussions we've had with the likes of BHP and Rio Tinto you know, they, their iron ore gets sold to Chinese steel mills and then the emissions come from those Chinese steel mills. They have very little control over how those Chinese steel mills use their iron ore. But what they can do is make partnerships and that's what they're doing. They're partnering with those, the users of their products. They're also partnering with universities to look into how to manage those. And that's really what we're expecting car companies in that space to do at this point in time. Some of them are starting to set some some targets around um, bringing customers online to new products. Um, and I think actually AGL in their long-term incentive, they have targets to incentivize 
um, management getting customers onto carbon neutral and green products. So that's mm. the kind of space that we're seeing the scope three play out in the net zero discussion. But very much the, the look for, for most of the companies we see is talking about net zero and talking about it within their operational control. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got a wonderful set of questions from um, the audience. And so let me invite our panelists uh, just to, to respond briefly and, and we'll move through uh, some of these. Uh, there was interest in the agricultural sector in particular and both the, the challenges, but also the opportunities in terms of sequestration that it might have. Um, can I get the panelists thoughts on that, please? Glenn, could I um, uh, have a crack at it? Um, so, so we see uh, worldwide about 20% of global emissions comes from the land sector. Uh, that's agriculture and the loss of forests uh, worldwide. Um, and some of those emission sectors in Australia, so agriculture, there's challenges, but there's a lot of very good research going on about how you reduce emissions uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, I want to also emphasise the opportunities. And so this has been touched on a little bit. Net zero for some sectors and currently out there does involve taking up the opportunity for nature-based sequestration, if you like, for sequestering carbon. And for instance, in Australia, we've got relatively early market um, experience in this space. There's a clean energy regulator. There's a process of being able to uh, approve methodologies for measuring and, and counting carbon farming, if you like. Um, there's ways of turning that into a financial instrument and, uh, and trading it. And we see the same in Europe and in California, but Australia is quite advanced, although still learning in this space. Now, those markets are very imperfect, by the way, but some success stories, um, indigenous fire management in the tropical savannah zone in Australia. Mm. So uh, many indigenous communities now across Cape York, um, the top end, uh, the Kimberley, are using traditional fire management to reduce the intensity of wildfires or fires lit for pastoral practices. And there's approved methodologies. You can measure the carbon saved by that change in fire management. Uh, the indigenous communities can earn income from it and it's uh, traded uh, in Australia. Uh, that in some ways is sort of just the tip of the iceberg, if I can terribly mix metaphors from the tropical savannah to the Antarctic. Uh, but um, uh, uh, you'll hear a lot of debate about carbon farming in soils in Australia. So bottom line here, coming as uh, someone with an environmental background, there's a tremendous opportunity here, not only to sequester carbon, but to help protect biodiversity and improve our soils and our agricultural systems out of this. So there's actually real opportunities for what we'd call co-benefits in this space. But I think Tony made the point right up front. If you look at the global carbon budget, it's important to realise the opportunities for sequestration are limited. They're not unlimited. There's much we need to do over the next decade on the loss of global forests. There's much we need to do to improve our agricultural systems, improve our soils and have sequestration as part of that. But we still have to cut emissions uh, substantially. So limits on how quickly we can drain the tub. Correct. The, the plug hole is quite small. That's a useful way of thinking about it. Thank you. Can I continue uh, the discussion around um, thinking about opportunities? Um, a question that came up was the potential for markets um, with carbon-based products uh, as, as a goal, as an input. Is there a, 
um, role of creating new markets for carbon-based products or services, sort of a circular economy, waste is resources philosophy. And in particular, is that something where the harder to abate sectors might play, have a role to play? Like I, um, I should have a little go at this one because I worked in this area a few years ago when I was at the Clinton Foundation. Um, the, the challenges here are, I mean, the simple answer is yes. The challenge is that most of it is either very expensive right now. I mean, we're worrying about, you know, $20 a tonne of CO2. We're talking $1,000 a tonne of CO2 at the moment for some of these things. Um, and the other challenge is the sheer scale of what has to be done. I mean, yes, you can turn carbon from um, coal-fired power stations or whatever into um, carbon, solid materials, carbonates, building materials, limestone, and so forth. Um, the problem is that there's so much of it, it comes back to Don's point, that doesn't get you out of jail. I mean, you would, we would drown. We'd have to, to use the carbonates, we'd have to be baking cakes all day almost um, out of sodium and calcium, uh, sodium bicarbonate. To absorb all that CO2 into solid materials, it would be absolutely extraordinary. Now, it, there are niche opportunities, I think, but really the world of CCUS um, has turned out to be so far uh, an unachievable goal in, this, in one sense. I mean, yes, we can use CO2 for um, injecting in oil and gas reservoirs to bring out more oil and gas. But of course, that's not, the objective isn't to achieve get more oil and gas here. <laughs> the objective is to get less oil and gas. So at some point that has to stop. And so I think this, this, it is worth people spending time of their own, certainly their shareholders' money, trying to work out how they can take advantage of those opportunities. But I, um, I personally am still very skeptical that we're going to see a lot coming out of that area. Um, I think it's going to be a side event, side event, to be honest. Thank you, Jody. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So um, on on this kind of circular economy, carbon company type product that we're seeing, um, it, it is a potential opportunity for companies and we tend to see the oil and gas industry only when they happen to be kind of well placed to um, a, a reservoir that's been depleted that that it's a viable opportunity uh, we've got a lot of companies talking about it uh, very few companies in actually investing in it or taking tangible actions into that area so you know again I, um, as a, a company I cover Santos they're talking about it with at Moomba they're putting actual um, dollar figures around the investment that they're going to make in the near term. So we are seeing it as something that's emerging, but again, it comes down to that, you know, is it feasible from, if it's an, a nature base, is it, is it a feasible reservoir? What's the permeability? And then also then the cost and the, the scalability of it. So um, what we tend to find is, you know, for the fossil fuel based circular economy, carbon companies are a opportunity. Um, but I think what we will see more so is that companies will have to diversify into, you know, wider energy products. They will um, have to reinvent themselves into other sectors, which will be a challenge because companies typically don't reinvent themselves particularly well. Um, but then I think also, you know, there would have to be a group out there that would just manage the decline. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, it, briefly, uh, several questions have come up regarding that question of carbon credits and, and offsets. And, and th there are so many opportunities out there. There are questions about uh, credibility, legitimacy, if you will. Um, and, and that there's certainly been some approaches by sector, whether it's forestry uh, or, or land, uh, others by particular regulators or organization. Um, gold standard. Um, would one of you um, help, help us understand a little bit what, what is the challenge and what are some solutions when it comes to establishing the legitimacy of different carbon credits? Well, there's two sorts of, um, of, of, of credits offsets, really. One is the sort of thing that Jody yeah. talked about before when a company says, look, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna buy, uh, pay for more renewable energy than we consume. Now, that's a good thing, um, and it might very well be. You know, the Greens talk about 700% renewables. Be very careful what that actually means. It does not mean that we're producing our we're selling electricity that's 100% renewable. What it means is 
Um, it's a bit like saying, you know, I've got a backyard garden where I grow tomatoes. For three months of the year, I grow four times as many tomatoes as we can eat. The rest of the year, I have to go and buy the tomatoes from the supermarket. I am not, um, you know, 100% tomatoes, my own tomatoes. I'm actually a bit of both. It's an arithmetic piece of work, which is in some ways justified, but can be interpreted as a bit of a trick. So I think that's where the big, one of the issues here. And so that issue of net, even net renewable is some net 100% net renewable needs to be thought about because sometimes people, when they say we're 100% renewable, what they really mean was in net 100% renewable. And the second piece is for real offsets, what I would call real offsets, that is put a ton in, take a ton out. There's not many things which achieve that. And Don referred to this before. There's planting trees, there's putting the CO2 into the soil, and there's direct, what's called direct air capture, capturing the CO2 from the atmosphere, and then using CCS in the way Jody described. Wow. All three of those are either limited, expensive, or highly questionable. There's some ways to go, I think. Would either of you like to add to that? I'll let Don go. I don't think I have a huge amount to add to that. <laughs> Uh, Jody, I'll just mention Tony touched on a fabulous technology for sequestration, uh, which is called a tree. And when you bring that technology to scale, it's called a forest. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I made the point before, Glenn, that the bathtub only has a small hole in the bottom, but it's still significant. If you reflect, the rate of deforestation worldwide, particularly the loss of the tropical rainforest and some of the boreal forests in the Northern Hemisphere, we're still pumping up miles of carbon into the atmosphere um, from the loss of these forests when we can be turning that around. Uh, and I think um, a good news piece out of this is it's gonna be in the business community's interest that we see better efforts at both valuing our existing forests and the opportunities to get carbon into soil, for example. So it's valuing more sustainable practices on our lands and oceans. There's, it's important from business's point of view that business engage in the policies around that. So governments need to act more strongly and there's um, economic opportunity there as well. Just to uh, touch on the core of part of your question, these are very um, young markets, if you'd like to use that point. And I said Australia is reasonably advanced. Um, and there are things like government methodologies in Australia, and there are also voluntary standards like gold standards. There's one really important gap in this marketplace, and business can play a role in experimenting and solving this. Uh, Microsoft, last year, uh, they made a decision to be net zero based on their historical emissions. Uh, and it's worth uh, recalling, uh, Tony mentioned this, when we put carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, it's not like smoke that is particulate and tends to wash out of the atmosphere after a rain uh, event, uh, carbon stays up in the atmosphere a long time, uh, generally more than 100 years. And so it's sort of like a cumulative uh, impact. Uh, that's why the bathtub's filling up. Uh, and um, one, one thing, here in that measurement space, Microsoft found that they were buying credits to sequester that historical emission, but they made the observation, none of the marketplaces were actually differentiating between whether it was like zero emissions today or whether it was actually reducing the overall mm. emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. So there's one um, great challenge for that market, and if you like, for the buyers of carbon. And they really should be uh, looking to promote the importance of purchase of credits 
in line with the Paris Agreement emission reductions that we are going to see formalised around net zero at the Glasgow negotiations later this year, by the way. Mm. Well, many more questions to go, but unfortunately, this brings us to uh, the end of our time together. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. There will be a, an email to all registrants with a link to a recording of today's event. Uh, and it's also a pleasure to invite you to our next event, A Pathway Out of the Pandemic, this Friday, also from 8 to 9 a.m. And you can register and get more information at mbs.edu slash events. And lastly, let me thank our panelists, Jody Barnes, Don Henry, and Tony Wood for their insights. Thank you and have a good day.